Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Answers Yes podcast, where we will explore the cause and effect of just saying yes in your everyday life or in business. I will dig into topics that are not just stimulating, but will challenge you to be better in everything you do. The podcast is based on the simplicity of saying yes to opportunities you might encounter every single day. I'm your host, Jim Riley. Join me in my first series titled, Blue Collar Redefined. Hello and welcome to the Answers Yes podcast. Hope you're having a great week. I know I am. I am constantly introduced to unique and interesting people for the show, and I've got a great network of friends that provide me tons of content, and today is no exception. My friend David Meltzer, who I talk about often on this show, and his you know daily plottings of writing down the things that you have more than enough in life, and I think we are all so grateful for the things that we have. Don't forget to do that, but Dave introduced me to um, a friend of his, and his name is David Greenberg, and I've got David on the phone right now for the interview. David, how's it going? How's it going with you today? All is good. Yeah, appreciate you making the time. I have dug into your website. I know we had a, a brief conversation this morning um, I, you know, I'm sure you've heard this, but you know, growing up, I'm 51, by the way, uh, my favorite movie was wall street and I'm, you know, you live that thing, right? Yeah. We were the real guys though. Um, <laughs> you know, I always said the stockbrokers were the guys at the Nick game with their ties tied up at 11 o'clock at night and, you know, all perfect. And the commodity guys were the guys that were probably drunk and wasted in ripped jeans and t-shirts by four o'clock in the afternoon. So, uh, you know, we were we were a much different crowd, but much more fun. Yeah, well, I, I like to hear that. But, you, you know, I just I lived vicariously through that movie. I thought I was going to make it big. Um, I took my Series 7. I missed it by one question. I said, screw it. I'm not going to do this. And I moved on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, believe me, it's it's not it's not a fun test. Well, listen, we've got a lot of things that we can talk about, and uh, just looking at your bio, I'm already intimidated by your history and the things that you've done. Especially knowing that I wanted to have my day in, on Wall Street. But what I'm curious, if you don't mind, just to take us back briefly uh, to your childhood. I, I'm I'm wondering, did you have a childhood job? You know, pre pre 16 years old, did you have a paper route, or was there anything? that engraved that, you know, gave you that work ethic that I see on paper today? Yeah, well, it was a mixture between, you know, my father having the work ethic that he did and, you know, pushing me. My first job, actually, I was working at my grandfather's bagel store. And uh, I remember people would come in in the bagel store and they would say, hey, Julie, you want to see a picture of my grandchild? And they would show him a picture of his little baby. And he would very proudly say, hey, you want to see my grandkid? And uh, they go, sure. I go, he's behind the register. Now, what he didn't know is that I had no idea what how to give out change. Like <laughs> I gave him a penny and made it from 16 cents to 15 cents. Uh-huh. So I used to literally take a handful of change and just give it to people. They would look at me and like, just leave. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know? So, so, yeah, and he'd pick me up at 4.30 in the morning when I was 12. And we would literally drop off the bagels to all the diners in Rockwell Center and Long Island. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, really got to see the inner workings and – and and that was my first start. And then I started, I worked all through college and you know, I had some real interesting things. Fascinating. Um, what was it that sparked you to uh, begin a career in, um, you know, with what you're doing? Well, the commodities end of it, my father, you know, which is an interesting story in itself. He was 39 and, and dead broke, but he was mathematical genius that graduated college three years early. He was literally going to the bathroom at a urinal and somebody next to him says, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm looking for a job. And he says, well, you should come down and see the commodities market. And because of his mathematical mindset and brain, he was able to figure out the silver spreads back in the day before there were computers and everything else and became one of the biggest silver traders in the world and then became chairman of the exchange. So it was something that I always did sit during the summers and, and I wanted to be a trader. Uh, but I knew that if I was going to go into the business that I had to learn from the ground up. Mm-hmm. So, I, so you know, I went out to Chicago, uh, started as a runner, making $3.75 an hour, two weeks out of graduating Syracuse University. Uh, did the runner for a while. Then I came back to New York. I was a clerk. I was a phone clerk. I was what we called a write-up clerk. I got ripped apart from the brokers, what they didn't show you in Wall Street. And this was the commodity trading floor as you know, compared to the stock trading floor, 
the clerks were treated in a way that in today's world would never, it would just never fly. I mean, they literally ripped us to shreds. Um, however, you know, it really toughened you up for when you finally got into the pit. Let, let me ask, can you expand on that a little bit? Because you know, I grew up in a world too, where things were really tough and, and high expectations of us as employees and workers. What do you mean by you guys getting ter- torn up? I mean, what did that look like? Because I would love for people to have a snapshot of that. Well, imagine if you will, in the, in the commodities world, we, we traded in a pit. So it was around, if anybody listening to this ever saw Trading Places, mm-hmm. it's that last scene in Trading Places, which was actually filmed in the gold pit, not in the orange juice pit. Mm-hmm. And imagine a broker standing up on a step and you know, you're this kid out of college and you're a step or two lower and he's in, got his finger in your face and he's spitting and he's and at times grabbing you by the collar because the pressure that they were under as, a, you know, as brokers and traders, I mean, the money that was going through people's hands back then, you know, was just astronomical. And there are traders such as myself that we only traded our own money. So when there was an error, it always cost a lot. And there were no rules down there. I mean, there was no politically correct stuff. There was no you know, let's just be nice to the guy. It was, you know, you know, really, you know, learn under fire. And one mistake there could cost somebody so much money that you just really couldn't afford to mess up. And if you did, they completely took your head off. It was, it was a wild experience. But at the same time, I look back and it really helped me go through what I didn't know would be my future. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You know, it's, it's those tough times that I like talking about because, in this day and age, people really think that uh, they're deserving of more and not having to do the hard work and, and the labor to get there. Um, I mentioned to you, I just got off the phone with David Meltzer, and we were talking about referrals. You know, somebody comes to you for a job referral, and oftentimes, especially nowadays, people are looking for that top-level job even though they just graduated. And uh, Dave's oh, I'm, like, I'm getting that all the time. I can't tell you how many people call me up and say, hey, my kid wants to be in finance. And I look at their resumes and I'm like, oh, my God, you know, this kid just skated through college. And what they don't realize is that it's not like the old days when I was younger that, you know, a little nepotism and knowing somebody, you know, could get in, you know, to to finance. And that's why I've been lecturing all around the country. I mean, I lectured at West Point Military Academy, Columbia Business School, Women's School of Management, Jack Welch, a whole bunch of things. And what I always tell these kids is what's going to make you unique across my desk? I mean, I, I tell everybody, though, your parents think you're special, but, you know, everyone's coming in with the same GPA, you know, the same course load, but what is going to make you stand out? And, and, the, and they're having a real problem with this. And to the point where my son, who had made the final cut for Brown, Dartmouth, and lacrosse, he blew out his ACL, and the school Haverford picked him up, which was a D3 instead of D1. And I said to his uh, guidance counselor, I think he can get into Haverford. And they says, well, if he gets in, make him, make him go. And I said, why? He says, oh, see all these nine kids with 2270 on the boards? I'm like, yeah, because they didn't get in. And, and my son ended up getting in. He got a 3-8, got a job at one of the top spots at Canton Fitzgerald, but hated it for four years. And I coached him through four years of college on, on what it was like to deal with stuff when, when you're just not happy with it. And yeah. It's, and people are going to have to start getting used to that. Yeah, they're... I mentor and I coach a lot of people um, that need to understand and that I can help through from athletes to young adults to CEOs, you know, about getting through things when, you know, when the crap hits the fan. Yeah, sure, sure. What, what twists and turns did your career take early on? Um, you know, maybe challenges or things that you had to say yes to, to keep going and, and, um, get to where you're at. Well, the, the interesting thing about my business is that there were, there were four different exchanges originally on one trading floor. So you had coffee, sugar, cocoa, which were the blue badges. And then you had orange juice, which was the orange badges. And then you had gold and silver, which was Comex and copper, which was the green badges. And then Nymex, which was the yellow. And I started out on Comex because that's where my father was. But I knew that once the Gulf War happened, that I wanted to jump from gold and go into crude oil. And crossing that line to going to the other side of the floor, it was almost like the Hatfields and McCoys. And it took me a long time to break in and you know, for them to understand that I was one of that group. Uh, and then what I had to do was I literally started out in the bottom of the pit 
is you kind of had to earn your way up to being closer to the top. Yeah. And I remember one day this guy that I knew got into a car accident and he crushed his ankle. Mm -hmm. So I jumped into his spot. And, you know, the, the, your spot was sacrosanct. Sank, it, sank it, was, it was your spot. You had to prove that you could be there, you know, just for the size that you traded, how much risk you would take, and the kind of cojones you had. Yeah. And I uh, remember somebody said to me, you can't stand here. This is Harvey's spot. And I just looked at him. I said, listen, the day Harvey comes back, I'll step down. Yeah. Well, it turns out Harvey went out on disability, so I never had to step down. Um, so I, I kind of inherited the spot. But I went through... I ended up doing every major and minor committee at the exchange. I ended up being chairman or vice chairman of every committee. I went through my first election. I remember I was taking on this guy from Brooklyn, and one of his friends came up to me, and he said, I got to tell you something. I'm like, yeah. He goes, we are going to do everything we can to crush you in this election. Huh. And, and I'm like, no, don't you want to hear my platform? I'm this young kid. Don't you want to hear my platform? Don't you want to hear what I want to do? He's like, no, we don't care. He goes, we're going to crush you. Like, you've never been crushed, but we want you to take it like a man. And I'm like, why? He says, because when we think you're ready, we're going to do everything we can to get you elected. You're mm. just too young and you're too experienced, but mm. we know that you've got potential. Mm -hmm. So I took it like a man. I lost by like 300 votes. And then the next year, I lost by only eight votes. And then I had to run again the next year. I literally lost by three votes. If I would have had two people vote the other way, it would have come my way. Yeah. And then finally, you know, after, you know, we had a big deal with something that happened with Goldman and a few other companies, I was elected to the board for three straight terms. I ended up being on the executive committee on the board, and we built the, the exchange from a valuation of $800 million, and then we brought it public for $12 billion. So it was quite a ride. I was offered the vice chairmanship of the exchange, uh, which I ended up turning down for different reasons. Um, but it was a great ride and there was nothing else like it in the world. It was literally like going to the Super Bowl every day for work. Yeah. It almost sounds surreal to me being a West coast boy. Uh, we don't, you know, out here, we, we don't live the exchange like you guys do. I've spent a lot of, a lot of evenings in PJ Clark's out there in Manhattan, overhearing conversations about being on the exchange floor that day. And, and, you know, they're putting down some kettle one back in the day when I worked there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so to me, it sounds. Yeah, you've been there, right? <laughs> yep. Um, so to me, it sounds surreal, and you've obviously accomplished a lot. Before I switch over to a, a topic that I really want to talk about with you, any advice for people that want to get into the business and work in the exchange and, and kind of follow a similar career path as you? Do you have any uh, just advice or thoughts for them? Well, you have to have a very, very, very deep deep spine, I guess you can say, because the kind of things that happen at the exchange and, you know, no one's going to be on the trading floor again. Those days are over. Uh, there'll never be a time when, you know, what you see on, on TV with CNBC and, and Fox and everything, mm -hmm. those, those things are just truly gone. I mean, what they have, you know, is, I always love how they take it from the because you know, for years I did CNBC and Fox. I was on, I was on CNBC and Fox probably you know five hundred times, and you know in the end of the day, that that set that they have on the trading floor now is on the trading floor because there's really no traders there. They just don't want to give the illusion that there's no traders. Yeah. So you know it's really you're going to have to get used to the fact that you're going to have to put in the time. You're going to have to have the schooling behind you. And you need the real computer and analytical skills. You know, you didn't need that when I was younger. It was really from the gut. You know, we were just, you know, really gut traders. Uh, but the key thing is, it's not only with trading, but with any business, you have to put in your time. And what you see with a lot of people now is like, as you just said, you know, they want the corner office and they want whatever. And the bottom line is, is that nothing comes easy. And, you know, these, everybody looks at these overnight successes that don't realize that they might have been 10 or 15 years in the making. Uh, and I think that it's, it's time that all the generations get together. And that's what I talk about in my lectures and my keynotes and my classes, that, you know, the gray hair in the room are historians and you should learn from them and not just pass them off because we've been through things that you could never even imagine. And, in every business, from Wall Street to widgets, 
There's going to be a time when the crap hits the fan. And a 